So uh, thank you very much for your wonderful presentations. I think uh, while we give uh, 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 Dr. Denisenko a moment to think of any comments he wants to, uh, to uh, direct back on uh, Father Miroslav's presentation, I think an underlying theme uh, that we've been seeing over these last two talks is the question of Ukraine and autocephaly is not just simply a Ukraine-centric issue. The issue of autocephaly and uh, um, authority in the Orthodox churches is really a universal issue. Um, we, uh, both speakers had mentioned uh, uh, the canonicity as being an issue and who possesses authority to grant canonicity. We have the uh, churches such as the Macedonian Orthodox Church, the church churches, two Orthodox churches in Estonia. One of them has been recognized as canonical by, uh, and the other one has not by different bodies in Orthodoxy. And even uh, Father uh, Denisenko's own church, the Orthodox Church in America, has had uh, some controversy over its own canonicity. So the Ukrainian church is, is really just a kind of a microcosm of a, a, a more global issue within Orthodoxy. And that is also tied to uh, uh, the question of authority within Orthodox uh, Catholic ecumenical dialogue, the dialogue that, uh, that mediates the relationships between, between two churches and who ultimately or what ultimately possesses an authority to grant such autocephaly and to, uh, to uh, really deal with the issues of uh, the pastoral care of not only churches in historical territories, such as in Ukraine and Estonia or Russia, but also these churches that exist in the diaspora, such as in North America and in Canada. So um, that's all I'll say while giving you a moment to think about any things that you might want to say in response to uh, 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 Dr. Miroslav's Tatan's talk. Uh, I'm going to keep it brief so that we have as much time as possible for questions. Thank you for your response. Um, I think you've given us a lot to think about. Uh, three things that I think are very important. Uh, it's, I'm not responding to everything that you said, but first, concerning the Ruski Mir, uh, the speeches given by Patriarch Kirill in 2009 and 2010, Patriarch Kirill in these speeches defines himself, the Moscow Patriarchate, as a multinational church. And he didn't invent the term. You can find the same term used by Metropolitan Filaret prior to his uh, departure from the Moscow Patriarchate and entrance into the uh, autocephalous church before the end of the Soviet period when he was responding to uh, autocephalous claims on the parts of Ukrainians. So there's a, there's a thread of a notion of a multinational church that, that runs right through here. And I think what's very interesting is how do you make sense of that thread where, if you look at all of the churches that are part of the Moscow Patriarchate in the world or churches uh, that the Moscow Patriarchate has been a patron for, it would be kind of hard to say, well, you know, technically speaking, it, it looks multinational. You know, you have the Autonomous Church in Japan. You have... Uh, uh, a Moscow patriarchal presence in, in numerous continents throughout this world. Uh, when they have their hierarchical synod, they like to say, well, we heard 72 languages being spoken here. Although the Ruski Mir initiative says that the official language of communication is Russian and the official language of worship is Church Slavonic and the baptismal mother of our church is Kiev. So... It's it, it, part of the work that needs to be done that has been done by scholars is the question of uh, what is the relationship and can you disentangle Russian nationalism from the notion of a patriarchate as a church, as a, as a community that's supposed to unite people throughout the world, um, a patriarchate that has this nationalism that's uh, circulating through its blood, if you will, of its members. And that's a very contentious issue. And there's a lot of literature on it, but I think it's a, a very important one. And, and perhaps I was a, a bit too dependent upon Patriarch Kirill's words himself. You know, I think that this is a very important point because what you have during the Soviet period is this uh, coalescing that Moscow begins to become the patron of all these churches. Poland rescinds autocephaly from the ecumenical patriarchate and receives it anew from the church in Moscow. They also become the patron uh, for the Orthodox Church in America. And, you know, the conditions of each specific situation need to be examined. 
But what it does is it exposes a question on what is a church for orthodox ecclesiology. And we think that these things are clearly defined, but, but maybe they're not. You know, maybe the, the, the waters are very muddy. The, now, the question of the Orthodox Church in Ukraine that I think is crucial here is, you know, we talked about Catholic Orthodox dialogue. Will it be an ecumenical church? And what I mean by that is if you, you know, I, I have in my office, and I recommend for those of you who like to read these things, the memoirs of Metropolitan Volodymyr Sabodan, his poetry, his essays that were edited and compiled. And, and for those of you who are interested in this, you can buy them at Spaso Prabrzezinski Sobor in Kiev. They, they have a whole museum dedicated to him there. It's a really interesting place. And he specifically says there, we had dialogue with the Autocephalous Church. That dialogue is now dissolved. We had dialogue with the Kievan Patriarchate. That dialogue is, is in the worst shape that it's ever been in. But we cannot have dialogue with the Greek Catholics because of the, the uh, unitism is something that the Balamond Agreement does not allow to be a method uh, for union. So until that issue is resolved in the Catholic side of things, we won't have dialogue. And what you see here among the people who seem to be coalescing around the new Orthodox Church in Ukraine is a willingness to dialogue. And I think that Moscow's withdrawal not only from uh, ecumenical or from Eucharistic communion, which is a, a you know, a really the Archbishop of uh, Albania had very strong words uh, in response to this. He had strong words also for the ecumenical patriarch. It's very important to note that. Uh, but they also withdrew from a certain part of uh, ecumenical dialogue in the world because they won't be in the same place as the ecumenical patriarchate. And so this is an issue, is, is will there be a new opening for ecumenical dialogue in Ukraine? Because as we know, conditions there um, are, are unique. And I would, I would like to refer you to the very good work by Thomas Bramer and Andrei Kravchuk, Churches in the Ukrainian Crisis. Um, it's a Palgrave Macmillan book. It's very expensive. But the essays in that book are, are really very well done, and they, they reflect almost exclusively on the current situation of the churches there. And then the last thing I think that's very important i just like to affirm is you talked about historical memory. Uh, all of the churches, I think in, in the post-imperial period, this applies to everyone. You know, if you look at, at even the churches of the... Bulgaria, Serbia, the Greek Orthodox churches, in a post-Ottoman sense, in a, a post-Soviet era, what is your ethic of historical memory? Not only a, a question, I think the question you raised about uh, Ukrainian figures is very important, but there's also a sense of, uh, is mission rooted in nostalgia for a past or is mission going to be rooted with, uh, towards and in conjunction, in cooperation and in prayer with the people who are part of the church today? Now, the Russian Orthodox scholars who are critical of the Ruski Mir, and I have a few of them in the bibliography in the book, will say that the Ruski Mir itself is too nostalgic, right? Um, but I think that that question has to uh, be one of reflection for all of the churches in and in fact, I think you could find scholarship, I'm waiting outside of my own waters here, that would say that the Ukrainian Greco-Catholics are also called for the same self-reflection. Oh, yeah. Would you have any comments? In, uh, I'll, I'll go with the last point. I, I think if you look at the great, Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church, my church I mean, one of the biggest questions I think, was, and, and thankfully there are some scholars who are actually touching upon this, how do you deal with a figure like uh, uh, Kostelnik? Mm -hmm. right? How do you deal with those figures? And... and, and but I think that it's incumbent upon all of us to, to recognize that that's, that's how you build a common narrative, right? Once you enter into those questions and deal with them. And I think nostalgia is a, is, is a challenging one. As long as, I think, as long as, I, it doesn't matter whether you're, you're, it doesn't matter what diasporic reality you're talking about, as long as the, the, the diaspora looks at its past in a nostalgic way, it'll never come to a, to a, a real understanding of what really is going on. So I, I agree with you. We have to get rid of nostalgia, or at least place it in its proper place. 
Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, so now we have a chance for uh, those present here. Uh, yes, Professor Magocci. Uh, 